This video is brought to you by The Native Oak and has been sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. When it comes to the popular perception of history, the media that we consume matters because whether we want it to or not, it informs the way that we conceptualize environments and situations that we in the 21st century can only really imagine. And that's why historical accuracy is so important and it's why I spend so much of my time curled up in the fetal position crying about the Patriots. But there exists plenty of historically inclined media outside of films and video games and the like. The world of music has all sorts of historically inspired pieces, some of which are excellent accuracy-wise, and they're really quite good at evoking the period that they discuss, while others are less so. Uh, thus we come to a curious case, The Cruel Wars by The Dreadnoughts, one of the only songs in existence that both a punk-loving metalhead friend of mine and I can enjoy together. The Longest Johns is another group that you may recognize with a rendition of this tune. I'd recommend giving it a listen before watching this video because I will have to interrupt it for the purposes of review. The Cruel Wars is unique in that it's split into two very distinctive sections, one of which is more modern, the other is more traditional, but we'll cover that later. Both of them deal with themes of a man going off to war during a, a vague, generalized, long 18th century setting with presumably the British Army, although much of it will apply across the board, really. Um, but enough of that introduction. Sure, the song heckin' slaps. Do people even say slaps anymore? But we're here for what really matters. How historically accurate is the song? A recruiting sergeant came away from an inn near town at the close of day. He said, my Johnny, you're a fine young man. Would you like to march along behind a military band with a scarlet coat and a fine cocked hat and a musket at your shoulder? The shilling he took and he kissed the book. Oh, poor Johnny, what'll happen to ya? So Johnny gets schmoozed by a recruiting sergeant telling tales of glory, and he decides to enlist. It's a classic tale that goes back to the advent of a volunteer army, and in that way, there really aren't any big inaccuracies here. But you know that I've got to get pretty petty about it. The sergeant offers Johnny a scarlet coat and a fine cocked hat. But for most, if not all, of the long 18th century, not every red coat was the same color. Privates and corporals, the majority of the army, wore cheaper made coats of a shade called matter red, so named after the rose matter from which the dye was produced. It's a darker, less vibrant shade of red, more like ruddy, if you will. Only officers and sergeants would be wearing that finer scarlet, that brighter shade of red, alongside with having things like different lacing patterns on their coats. The coats are generally far more expensive to produce than a regular enlisted man's coat. And in an era before things like standardized chevron systems were being used to denote ranks, uh, this is the sort of thing that helped men to quickly identify their superiors when they're in a line alongside a number of other features like, uh, like the equipment that these different ranks of men would carry. So it's possible here, yes, that the recruiting sergeant is trying to coax Johnny with tales of how he could become an officer and he could become a gentleman through the service. Such a thing was definitely possible as significant numbers of British officers were actually men promoted from the ranks, contrary to popular opinion. Um, it's just that such a thing wouldn't have been the common experience for a soldier, and so it would still be a matter of the, of the recruiting sergeant kind of talking things up more than might reasonably be expected. But do you know what would be a common experience for soldiers? Well, it's this video's sponsor, of course, Raid Shadow Legends. After the army began issuing smartphones to all of their men, various military theorists would offer recommendations recommendations for how regiments might best apply these tools. One author would recommend the playing of mobile games to maintain the men's morale, writing, As the particular title of Raid Shadow Legends is set within a fantastical world, much unlike our own, it might readily deter soldiers from more destructive habits of idleness. As the game is free to play, it has already garnered some 80 million downloads, and the discerning subaltern need not be concerned with supplies of content running dry, as new champions and upgrades are released every month. Indeed, the game was met with uh, such success that it quickly came to the attention of the general staff. And before publishing their new manual exercise in 1764, horse guards began an inquiry into how certain champions and their unique abilities might influence military movements. Like, look at this guy. Kale, this dark, wizardy looking fella right there. He has a move called Acid Rain. You might be thinking, oh, well, that's just, you know, probably some metaphorical. No, it literally makes acid fall from the sky. And I feel like you can 
you can kind of see the military utility for that guy. Look at these two guys, for example. Look at these two. So these two boys in open order. Oh no, how are we ever gonna get both of them? Look at that, acid rain. Massive damage to both sides. You can, I think you can see the military utility of that kind of thing and why horse guards would be so inclined to take it up. However, Raid was nothing if not equal in their comfort to the armies as they offered another benefit which would come to be of great value to rebel forces as well. Our forces were greatly benefited by some phones captured off of British shipping which came installed with Raid. The game has recently released a new legendary champion based after a certain Ronda Rousey whom they term an MMA player. The lads were doubtful at first, but were soon able to unlock the character simply by playing the game for seven days before February the 20th. In studying her various abilities, we were able to learn how to move and fire with greater alacrity than ever before, and soon use these talents to great effect. Of course, when we used the link in the description of Brandon F's most recent video, though he is a most despicable Tory, we found great bonuses to enhance our abilities further, which most assuredly aided our efforts. The last bit is kind of weird. Well, anyways, thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and now let us return to the Cruel Wars. The sergeant tells Johnny that he can march with a musket at his shoulder, and that's definitely a reference to Johnny enlisting as a private, not some, like, special rare officerial promotion type thing. Uh, more often than not, the weapons that officers were carrying throughout this time period were more ceremonial, uh, pikes and swords and the like. Uh, I actually have a video all about pole arms in the time period if you're interested in learning more about why that is. Uh, now, during the American War of Independence though, a widespread fashion was for junior officers to carry a kind of uh, lighter, shortened musket called a fusee. It helped them to blend in with their men from a distance, and a big part of it was really just changing military fashion. Uh, but they would very rarely be used in actual battle, more, more for sporting than anything else, uh, as officers were more focused on giving orders than they were on shooting. Uh, but if the recruiting sergeant was referring to a fusee as well, I have a feeling that he would say it outright. Um, so overall, I think that a fair assessment of this particular portion is that the lyrics just got the uniform color wrong. Then of course, Johnny takes the shilling. Uh, this refers to what was basically a sign-on bonus that every man was given when he joined the army. Taking the king's shilling was a common turn of phrase for enlisting in the military, although at least by the American War of Independence, the bounty was generally much higher than this. Uh, it also wasn't a figure that was formally set by government, but would vary from regiment to regiment and even by individual. Uh, from the excellent book uh, Noble Volunteers, which is an excellent resource if you're interested in this kind of stuff, quote, In the late 1760s and early 70s, this was usually 21 shillings, one pound, one shilling, the value of the widely circulated gold guinea coin. A savvy candidate could bargain for more, or the recruiter could offer more to a promising prospect. One writer advised officers to offer no more than one pound 11 shillings, consistent with the no more than a guinea and a half offered by the 17th Regiment of Foot in 1767. This was about a month's pay for typical working class people. Not a life-changing sum, but quite an enticement for a young man with an adventurous spirit and stuck in a monotonous laboring life. As to Johnny kissing the book, I presume that this is referring to a Bible, as upon enlisting, men were required to swear that they were Protestant and that they were born to Protestant parents. At least until the uh, Papist Act 1778, it was illegal for Roman Catholics to serve in the British Army. Uh, this, alongside a number of other emancipations, was changed out of fears of revolt in Ireland and partly out of a need to bolster the army for a rapidly globalizing American War of Independence. The recruiting sergeant marched away from the inn near town at the break of day. Johnny came to with half a ring. He was up to be a soldier to go fighting for the king. In a far off war, in a far off land, to face the foreign soldier. But how will you fare when there's lead in the air? Oh, poor Johnny, what'll happen to ya? So Johnny lists for a soldier and marches off to meet his regiment with questionable dreams of glory in his heart. Now really, there's only one thing here to question, that reference to half a ring. Now at first I figured that this was some sort of like a reference to a hangover? I, I don't drink, so I don't really know how people talk about that kind of thing. I just kind of assumed that's what they were going for. Um, but I assumed that this was based off of a very common misconception that men would often be tricked into enlisting through drink and other nefarious measures. A, a sergeant gets his man drunk, slips him a coin, and bam, just like that, he's in the army. Uh, or even worse, there's this old legend that uh, when men would finish their drinks, they'd find a coin at the bottom of the drink, which 
somehow means that they accepted it and then they were forced to join the army. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but such trickery would have been, I mean, it would have been rare if it ever even occurred. I mean, the whole coin at the bottom of the cup thing, that, that's nonsense. Um, because men, after they accepted the king's bounty, um, they actually had a period afterwards where they were legally entitled to change their minds, to back out of the deal. It's not like as soon as they accepted the bounty, they're in the army for life. No, it, it, they had a period to, like, you know what, actually? I'm not gonna enlist, I'm not gonna sign that paperwork, I'm, I'm gonna back out. It would be illegal, and as such, unlikely, I think, for men to uh, basically be tricked into joining the military while drunk and then having no legal recourse. Is it possible that it happened on occasion? Yeah, I'm sure there's an instance at some point or other in this entire long, long time period of that kind of thing. I'm just saying that it was nowhere near so common as popularly it's made out to be, and there's no reason to believe that it did happen unless we have solid uh, examples, solid primary sources that say otherwise. Uh, there is also a bunch of legal arguments from this time period, it's something that if you're interested in looking more into it, there's a bunch of legal arguments from the period where men would be forced out of their decision to enlist due to legal obligations that they had at home which prevented their leaving. Uh, for example, there was a big question about whether or not it was legal to enlist apprentices or not, um, and that's something that could be brought to court by the apprentice's master should his charge have been illegally recruited. It's not like the army can just snatch up any, anyone who they want, there are qualifications and there are legal ramifications and indeed there are court cases to reinforce all this. Uh, in any case, I'm rambling. Uh, doing a bit of searching online, I found out that there really aren't any definitive answers for what this half a ring might refer to. Uh, indeed, though, it could well just be half of a piece of jewelry. And I found at least one source talking about an interesting idea suggesting what it might be referred to as a broken token. The idea being that it's a, it's a token of some sort, a piece of jewelry or some other meaningful object that was literally broken in two by two lovers to represent their separation and to literally help them identify each other by connecting the two halves when the soldier returns. I don't know about the history of this idea, how common it may have been, or whether it even happened at all, actually. Uh, I found one, like, really old, poorly formatted article that was talking about it. It said that it was really difficult to prove, um, like, any references to this practice that was prior to, like, the late Victorian era. And so initially, that made me think that this entire idea was just another Victorian invention. There's a heck of a lot of them. Uh, I couldn't really find any direct references to it on the internet either, except for that one article, until I did find this, a song that is literally called The Broken Token, published in 1813. So it's well within our time frame here, and supposedly, according to the publication, it says it's like an old folk song, Supposedly, it goes back further, and it describes exactly this practice. A, a sailor is given half a ring before going off to the wars, and then when he returns years later, his lover doesn't recognize him until he shows her his half. They can connect the two, and it's like, oh, it's you, Joe, or whatever, and so they're reunited. Uh, so overall, I mean, like, it's one song that talks about the idea, that's not proof that it was really a common practice. There's only one article that's saying that it probably wasn't a practice. I'm not sure. So I'm going to chalk this one up as needs further research. Maybe another video idea. There's not enough of those floating around. Um, but regardless of, you know, but regardless of the accuracy of the actual practice, it at least appears like the idea did exist. So I'm going to for the songwriter's purposes, I'm gonna give it a cautious approval for the time being. Well, the sun rose high on a barren land where the thin red line made a military stand. There was slingshot, chain shot, grape shot too. Swords and bayonets thrusting through. Poor Johnny fell, but the day was won, and the king is grateful to ya. But your soldier is done, and they're sending you home. Oh, poor Johnny, what'll happen to ya? I really love how the song is vague here as it comes to the location and to the opponent that's being fought. It doesn't say, oh, the sun rose high on the field of Waterloo and the French were making a stand. It doesn't get into the specifics there. It allows the song to apply to pretty much anything from the time period, be it, you know, the War of Austrian Succession up to fighting Napoleon. Now, admittedly, the phrase thin red line generally refers to the Crimean War, but it can pretty obviously apply to earlier time periods as well. Um, and I was even able to find at least one reference going back to 1804 with 
with that same language, although it's not being used in exactly the same way. But the, the terminology can apply either way. But then we get to this weird list of artillery rounds. So, grape shot is easy. It's an anti-personnel round that, much like a canister shot, uh, features a series of smaller projectiles all wrapped up into a single round that, when fired, is basically like a big shotgun. It, it's great for close range against those tightly packed infantry formations, uh, and it's something that was used on both land and on sea. Uh, now, chain shot, though, Chain shot doesn't really make as much sense here. It consisted of two smaller cannonballs that were connected, you guessed it, by a chain. And it was designed specifically for naval warfare, where it was used to damage an enemy's masts and rigging. You know, all those ropes and lines everywhere and everything that are used to actually, like, steer and control the ship. You know, you shoot these, you know, wads of chain into it, and you can really tear that stuff up. Um, now, I mean, obviously, yes, if you were to shoot uh, a chain shot into, uh, you know, a clump of infantry, it's going to do some damage. Uh, but it wasn't really issued to land armies because it wasn't designed for land service. Like, you could use it, sure, but you could also, like, you know, shove a bunch of nails into a cannon and it would also do a whole bunch of damage. It wasn't, like, regularly being used for land service, though. Uh, uh, compared with a round shot, Chain shot's not going to have anywhere near the range or accuracy, uh, nor would it have the destructive potential at closer range of canister or grape shot. Uh, that being said, again, there are some rare instances of it being used in land, for, uh, land warfare. It just wasn't usually the case. Now, slingshot, to the best of my knowledge, is just nonsense. I've never heard of it before, and I cannot find any references to it whatsoever, uh, searching even for, for like all books between 1700 and 1850. It renders nothing beyond, well, slingshots. It sounds to me like a modern made-up term uh, for, like, I guess, I guess chain shot or something like that. Um, it's a shame, you know, considering how many real examples of shot uh, that could have been put into the song instead, like round shot, canister, carcass, even basic shrapnel rounds were in use by the, like, the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but swords and bayonets thrusting through, oh yeah, that, that happened. Brutal stuff. They said he was a hero and not to grieve for the two ruined legs in the empty sleeve. Took him home and they set him down with a military pension and a medal from the crown. But you haven't an arm, you haven't a leg, the enemy nearly slew ya. You'll have to go out in the streets and beg, oh poor Johnny, what'll happen to ya? Now this one is a disturbingly modern sentiment. Not because it's inaccurate, but because of just how accurate it is, and not just to the 18th century, as we're aware, uh, but medals from the crown weren't really a thing, at least not for enlisted men during this time period. Uh, the first service medals only really start coming out after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, so like after the long 18th century that this song is presumably set in, talking about cocked hats and all that. Um, although, admittedly, a very limited number of them did retroactively apply to the Napoleonic Wars, well, particularly to the Waterloo campaign, um, so it, it can be accurate in some fashion, but otherwise the closest thing that you're going to get here would be a medal or some other token of merit that was given by the regiment, not by the king, not by the government, but by the individual regiment. Uh, some of them would offer rewards like that to their men to recognize particularly noteworthy service as a way to reward good behavior and set examples to the rest. Uh, you'll find references to it in Cuthbertson where he refers to things like uh, orders of merit and whatnot. Um, but the practice wasn't official law. It wouldn't have been applied, like, to the entirety of the army. It was on an irregular basis. Again, it, it would vary. As to the military pension that he receives, there's a more interesting story, I think. Uh, when a man was discharged, he was given a document that would detail his personal information, why he was being discharged, and his service history, alongside potential recommendations from his officers. Uh, he would be given a voyage, often back to England, and he would be paid off for a number of extra days that was deemed sufficient for him to travel back home. Uh, for example, a Scottish soldier might expect a little bit more of that, like, uh, ending pay, or what have you, uh, termination pay, I guess, uh, because of the difficulties that he would face in going so far north when compared with if a soldier was from, like, Bristol or something. But the actual pensions weren't guaranteed. It, it wasn't a universal practice for all veterans to receive them. If a soldier wanted to get a pension, he was required to make a physical appearance before a pension board. 
He would present them with his discharge paper. The board would speak, interview with him, basically. And then they would deliberate on whether a pension was to be issued. Uh, generally, men could expect to receive a pension if they had served for a lengthy amount of time or if they were rendered unfit to work, if they were injured in some capacity due to their service. Uh, although, you know, sometimes a service of even like over five years wouldn't be sufficient. We're talking more like 20 years of service here for that pension. Uh, to read more about the fate of British veterans after the revolution in particular, again, Noble Volunteers, great book. Uh, you can find a link to it on the website. And finally, the fifth stanza is simply a repeat of the first, a poetic bookend as we look back to the hope that Johnny had upon his enlisting and the tragic fate which befell him. Now this song was not actually written by the Dreadnoughts so much as it was composed by them. Most of the original lyrics to that first half come from a song called Fighting for Strangers by Steely Span in the dark days of 1969. It has a a bit of a different vibe. Uh, the second half, though, of the Dreadnoughts version takes a thematic shift which I think complements the Steel Eye Span lyrics quite well. Um, it's more directly from a real 18th century song called High Germany. Although some of the uh, lyrics here are changed, the idea behind the song on the whole is still much the same, and at its core, it really doesn't get anything wrong for that reason. It's, it's literally mostly from the time period. So I'll just do a quick read through of the lyrics here and then we'll talk about it as a whole. Um, it goes, Oh Polly love, the route is now begun and we must go a marching to the beating of a drum. Come dress yourself in all your best and come along with me. I'll take you to the cruel wars in high Germany. Worthy of note there, the more traditional verse that I'm used to hearing would be, I'll take you to the wars, my love, in high Germany. Not quite so cruel in the original verse. Uh, in any case, Oh, dearest Harry, mind what I say, my feet are tender, I cannot march away. Besides, I am with child by thee, not fitted for the cruel wars in high Germany. I'll buy you a horse, my love, and on it you shall ride, and all my delight shall be walking at your side. We'll stop at every alehouse and drink when we're dry. Be true to one another, get married by and by. Oh, cursed be the cruel wars that ever they should rise, and out of merry England press many a man likewise. They took her Harry from her, likewise her brothers three, and sent them to the cruel wars in high Germany. It is worth pointing out that for the vast majority of British history, uh, while the navy was permitted to press or force men into service, the army was not. It was a volunteer force. Um, although I don't think that the lyrics here um, have to specifically be referring to the army forcing men to join it, so much as the cruel wars themselves drawing these men away to their unfortunate and unexpected sometimes demise. Uh, and of course the lyrics like that particular turn of phrase, I believe it is original to the 18th century. So, so it does still work. I just wanted to add a little addendum to it there. Um, but as far as the actual story itself is concerned, the man asking his lover to join him on campaign, it isn't so outlandish as you might assume. Uh, camp followers, as they were called, were a major part of pretty much every 18th century army. Uh, unlike what is commonly believed, these weren't prostitutes and gamblers and thieves or preying on the army. They were actually an integrated part of regimental and army life. Uh, they were the wives of the soldiers, sometimes even their children, as well as civilian contractors like wagon drivers and merchants who would supply the force. Soldiers' wives were often officially documented by the regiment. It's not like they are just following after, trailing after. They were on the books. Uh, they regularly took jobs as well with the regiment. Uh, not cooking, that was done by the men, big misconception there, but they would do things like laundry, which were vital military roles played largely by women. Uh, they were paid by the regiment for this work as well, same as the soldiers were paid, and they were issued military rations as well. Nor was this seen as a cruel fate. Women were often very desirous of accompanying their men for a variety of reasons. Everything from, you know, this 18th century, from security and pay and whatnot, you know, protection in a rather cruel and rather uh, male-dominated world, uh, but then of course also from the natural desire to accompany their husbands, who may not return from military service for many, many years at a time, if they do at all. Um, 
though uh, not all women would be able to join their husbands on the service, and certain regiments might have different techniques for determining who gets to come with the army and who gets left behind. And that altogether, my dear viewer, is The Cruel Wars. It's a great song, very catchy, and while, sure, you know, it gets a few of the smaller details incorrect, I think that on the whole, it really is quite an authentic feeling, and indeed historically accurate, portrayal of life for a soldier during the long 18th century. It's a bit of a negative portrayal, to be sure, but... There's a lot of negativity in 18th century life, isn't there? And I think that accuracy is important because music can be an incredibly powerful tool in offering people an aesthetic feeling about certain time periods. You know, if it's accurate, then it can help people to understand why the world is the way it is, but other times it might be an inaccurate aesthetic and so give people false perceptions, not only of how the world once was, but also how it is today. Um, Overall, I suppose I would give The Cruel Wars an upper second in this regard. I, I give it a solid B. There's a few detracting errors, but you know, for the most part, they're over smaller things that don't matter as much. Uh, overall, solid portrayal. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of service. This video was made possible by these most glorious individuals who support my work on Patreon, as well as those who enjoy my videos early on Recast.tv, which is free to do, by the by, and helps me out a ton. So thank you all as ever for your support. And of course, one last thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. You can click on the link in the description down below if you'd like to download the game today.